This is your urgent call to action. We are all called to lead in a world in chaos, crisis, and turmoil. Join a pivotal global movement for change to transform the leadership crisis worldwide. Will you play it safe, or will you wake up, step up, and speak out? Like Nelson Mandela did for South Africa and the world, we need a radical new way to think, act, and lead, leading boldly into the future. Join host Ann Pratt, a Harvard Fellow and multi-awarded businesswoman, and unlock the best version of yourself to revolutionize leadership with what the world needs now. Greetings to all your future bold leaders. Thank you for joining us from around the world. My name is Anne Pratt. I'm formerly from South Africa, and I relocated abroad to attend a Harvard Advanced Leadership Initiative Fellowship in beautiful Boston in the United States of America. Today, our thoughtful bold leader joins us from the beautiful mountainous area of the Berkshires in Western Massachusetts, well-renowned for its annual musical festivals, including performances by the Boston Symphony Orchestra. He is a former presidential candidate. He is also the first black governor in the state of Massachusetts in the United States of America and served two terms between 2007 and 2015. He is the former Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights in the Department of Justice during the Clinton administration, a partner of two Boston law firms and a senior executive of two Fortune Top 50 companies. He is currently a professor of practice and co-director for the Center of Public Leadership at Harvard Kennedy School. He grew up on the southern side of Chicago. Assisted by a nonprofit called A Better Chance, he attended the prestigious Milton Academy, Harvard College, and Harvard Law School. Between college and law school, he lived and worked in East and West Africa. Stay tuned as we learn more about his Mandela moment, which happened during a ride he hitched from Cairo in North Africa to Khartoum in Sudan. What truly makes America great? The American ideals. And why a message of unity is harder to hear in this age of sensationalism and celebrities. We warmly welcome the 71st and first black governor of the state of Massachusetts, Governor Deval Patrick and welcome to Leading Boldly into the Future. Governor, it's always so wonderful to see you. Thank you so much for joining this conversation. And it's such um, a privilege to have you as part of this global Mandela Leadership Movement for Change. Thank the you. The honor is mine. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anne. You know, I thought, I thought a good place to begin is near the beginning. I, I know you grew up on the south side of Chicago mm -hmm. um, with a wonderful mother, Emily May. And I think you lived in a two-bed apartment in what I think was the John Taylor housing project. Quite close, not 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 in it, but just a half a block in, right? Half a block in. Anyway, fast forward fifty plus years, the former um, governor of Illinois, Pat Quinn, renamed part of Wabash Avenue in your honor mm. and called it Deval Patrick Way. I thought a wonderful starting point would be to understand what is the Deval Patrick leadership way? Mm. And how would you define leadership? Well, I'll define it first as we define it at the Kennedy School in the Center for Public Leadership where I work now, which is uh, this notion of principled, effective public leadership, meaning leadership that is not just uh, in the public sector, but uh, leadership that uh, in any sector is um, elevating the public good um, yeah. and is doing that in a way that uh, is about uh, conviction um, and also, um, you know, delivering results. And so I, I believe um, personally in a, in, a, in a leadership that is, uh, I would describe as servant leadership. Yeah. That there is humility that should come with uh, the weight and responsibility of leadership, that you should listen to and engage with the people you lead, that you should, um, you should 
uh, support and encourage their own engagement with each other, that we should, that good leaders, the best leaders ask uh, people to turn to each other rather than on each other, which is, uh, I'm sad to say, the latter version of which is a lot of what we get nowadays. Yeah, and that's that's an interesting segue. And I know you're co-chair for the Center of Public Leadership and also professor of practice in public leadership. Uh, my my following question from that is, you know, you personally have worked in multiple sectors. You've had a remarkable career um, from the business sector to the nonprofit to public service sector in the Clinton administration. Um, I think President Clinton appointed you as Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights Division and DOJ. And of course, you were the first um, African-American governor and the 71st governor of the state of Massachusetts between 2007 and 2015. My question is, given that incredible track record of experience and living through a lot of the changes in the United States today, what do you believe, how do you believe public sector leadership has changed, number one? Mm. And following on from that, what do you think are the critical success factors given these remarkable deep divides in public sector leadership today? And there's so much in your question. Um, uh, and I, I will, let me let me try it this way, but, but mindful that this is one person's opinion. Um, of course. With, with uh, one person's uh, perspective. I think it has always been the case, and that political leaders in particular and, and candidates have had to, uh, to display some balance, some combination of substance and performance art. Yeah. You know, that, you, that you couldn't be just a policy wonk. You had to have some way of drawing people in, but you couldn't just be a performer. You had to have some substance. Of course. Now, sadly, I think um, it's all about performance. It's all about outrage. It's all about attention grabbing. Um, and there's very little um, listening. I mean, I'll tell you that um, what I sense, uh, and you mentioned the divisions in the country. Yeah. I had a hunch and still have a hunch that we are less divided than we are portrayed. It's the division that um, gets the media's attention, that is driven by and in social media. We started a project uh, at CPL called Shared America to really examine that. And I think in the early days, um, I'm very much confirmed or affirmed that that is true. That in fact, what is happening, um, and it, by the way, it's equally dangerous to our democracy, but what yeah. is happening is that more and more people are just checking out. They see all that on TV, they see all yeah. that in Washington, and it's just noise um, after which some powerful people will make the decisions, if there are any decisions at all. You know, that does not portend well for democracy if it's so, if it's not just not functioning, but is also discouraging. Yeah. Uh, and that's, uh, there is something about the leadership I think we often get, not always, there's some shining uh, uh, exceptions to that. I think President Biden is an exception uh, to that, but not all, not enough of our leadership is actually interested in serving the people they elected to serve. It's quite, it's quite apparent. And there isn't the kind of, um, I don't know, there's no sense of real uh, conscience calling them back to the servant part of their uh, assignment. And that, that is deeply concerning. Yeah. There are hopeful signs too, but those are some of my concerns about our leadership today. And in the broader sense of leadership, um, taking it beyond public sector leadership in, in the United States, what are the big leadership issues that keep you concerned and awake at night and motivates and inspires you to do this work with our next generation at uh, Harvard Kennedy School? Well, I, I will say that the things that um, have concerned me all along about public or private um, uh, leadership are the very things that caused me to run for governor in the first place, which is the first thing I'd ever run for. And that I, I still observe, I, that still concern me. But I, I remind me to come to the point, uh, to the part of what is uh, hopeful, because I, I do think there are hopeful signs. Yeah. I think, number one, we've been, we've been stuck in a fascination uh, or an obsession with the short term. I think both in, in business, that sort of quarter to quarter management. Mm -hmm. In politics, it's the election cycle to election cycle or news cycle to news mm -hmm. cycle, when we must all be about the next generation. It, we have to be, we have to make the hard decisions now 
that will make a difference over time. By the way, that is how a way was made for us. Yeah. Um, it's not that we can't we can't be in the moment. That's not what I'm saying. I, I mean, we have to be mindful uh, of the precedential and consequential uh, outcomes of the decisions we make right now. And we should, in think, I think, in more and more cases, really try to draw the long term into the center of the of the policy or the business decisions uh, we're making uh, we're making today. That's the first thing. The second thing that's on my mind um, is that um, we are, um, whether in public or private life, uh, we have leaders, I think, who've spent a lot of time and energy thinking about how to get the job, not so much about how to do it. Yeah. You know, they, they, and when they get the job, um, they want to accumulate political capital, not spend it. Uh, and I, as I say, I've observed this in both the public and the private sector, but it's the spending of that political capital. It's the it's bringing your credibility to bear yes. that persuades people to do the things that need to be done to govern for or manage for uh, a generation to come. So to bring that generational responsibility, I think, to our work, um, whether it's as a business leader or a private sector leader or not for profit sector leader, I think is absolutely uh, critical. And that is what I look for. And that is what I celebrate. That, I think, uh, was so central to what uh, uh, Mandela himself was, uh, uh, was about. And speaking of Mandela, there's another thing. Yeah. And that's grace. Uh, there is none of us, none of us are complete. We're all broken. Yeah. Um, we, we all have our blind spots. We all have our limitations. I feel as if, you know, if our leadership, if our leaders modeled more kindness um, and, uh, and showed us that you didn't have to confuse that for weakness or for a lack of mental toughness and conviction, yeah. that it would spawn more of that behavior, um, encourage more of that behavior, which I know exists among ordinary people, to bring that out into the light. And I've seen that in my own experience. You know, it's, uh, you make such a powerful point. I was actually sharing with a friend yesterday, Governor, that uh, I think kindness is one of the most underrated, mm -hmm. underappreciated and undervalued assets we have in the world. And, um, you know, the question is from a leader, exercising leadership point of view, how do we engender more of that? And I think to your point around the issue of short-term focus, you know, at the expense of long-term gain, you know, how do we break the cycle within the systems when the systems are rewarding short-term behavior? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, I, I, in my, um, among my uh, business activities, I'm an impact investor. Yeah. I, I launched a, uh, uh, an impact fund at Bain Capital after I left uh, the, uh, uh, the governor's office. And I think impact investing is very much about how to think about multiple bottom lines, how to, yeah. uh, how to manage for uh, long-term value, and being able to deliver that uh, both the uh, the in our case uh, social or, or environmental me uh, measurable impact over time, as well as superior financial return, and showing that you don't have to you may choose to, but that you don't have to trade the one for the other, I think raises some really important questions about how investing is normally done, how business is normally uh, done. I think there are sector, sectoral um, uh, um, changes and movements that are driving that, mostly from uh, a younger generation or two. Yeah. Uh, and that's very, uh, that's very exciting and, and encouraging. So, um, and then, in, you know, in the, in, the, um, in the public sector, I mean, the, the hardest advice I think I give to candidates who, who call and say, you know, how should I think about this? I always ask them, first of all, why they want to run for this or that, because they immediately launch into, you know, their path to victory and so forth, and yeah. how much money they're going to raise and how many endorsements and all that. Um, and then I, I ask them, uh, as we explore why, uh, are they willing to lose? Are they willing to bring real conviction, which does not mean that they have no time for people who don't already agree with them. That's not what I mean. Yeah, um, but that they have a reason for wanting to serve, and let that reason come through. People will know; they'll know when you don't. They'll know when it's yeah. just ambition, right? Yeah, I think it's so, um, in a way, out of fashion uh, to bring um, 
real conviction to political uh, ambition. And uh, one of the things I'm, I'm trying to do is encourage uh, the folks I teach at the, and come in contact with at the Kennedy School and elsewhere uh, to, uh, to bring all of themselves, including those convictions, um, right to the surface as they run. You know, that's, that's um, a great point, Governor. And I know when you ran in 2020 for the, you know, stepped into the presidential race, I think you yourself mentioned that America is great because America is good. And it comes back to a lot of these core values of, of mm -hmm. you know, the American democracy, the American experiment. Um, and I also know at the Center of Public Leadership at Harvard Kennedy School, you're engaged in a project of shared aspirations. To what extent do you think, can you share a little more about that initiative? And to what extent do you think getting back to those core values of America is good, is critical in the world of, of American and world leadership today? But I'd like you to contextualize that because you also said when you ran for president that, you know, and to a large extent, winning that kind of race is about sensationalism and being a celebrity and you don't kind of see yourself as a sensationalist or a celebrity. How do you juxtaposition those shared aspirations and shared values with the current politics of the day that may or may not be about sensationalism and being a celebrity? Again, so much in your question, Anne, and I'm, I'm touched that you would bring up uh, my uh, my presidential campaign. It only lasted 15 minutes, but uh, they, they're old they're, they're long held um, views that that our our greatness as a nation is not actually um, because of our you know our wealth or uh, or our military might. There are great nations of great wealth and great militaries that have come and gone with the winds of time. Yeah, our our greatness has to do with being organized, and I think the only nation in human history organized not around ge geography or race or religion or, um, uh, or, or, you know, the kinds of things that normally define uh, uh, a nation. We're organized around a handful of civic ideals. Um, this notion of freedom we have defined over time to mean equality and opportunity and fair play. And we were flawed from the start. Be no, make no mistake about that. But it's the, it's the striving toward those ideals those ideals being enduring and um, inspiring uh, to everybody everywhere. When we are working to close those gaps, we are stronger. Yeah. And when we are careless about closing those gaps, we are, we are less strong. And, and history plays that out. You talk to most diplomats and American uh, military leaders, and they will say the same thing. Yeah. Um, our influence, our power has a lot to do with our sincerity about uh, our honesty about the gaps and our sincerity about trying to close them. And I, I think that the domestically, the um, American narrative, that American dream that I've lived growing up a poor kid and having a way through education um, to, uh, uh, to be exposed to the kinds of opportunities I've had, I think that is a compelling part of that story, but it's broken. And uh, we've had economic mobility stalled out, economic inequality growing. Um, and it's, that is, this didn't happen overnight. This has been going on. We've been creeping toward it for the last 30 or 40 years. Yeah. And so um, it's interesting. If you, if you read, someone pointed this out to me recently. If you read slave narratives, they are more hopeful about the day when freedom comes, when their opportunity, their chance would come in their generation or in the, or the next, then many young people in urban communities are today. Wow. And, uh, and yet, for all of the sensational uh, uh, division, um, you know, that is, pro that is promoted by our uh, would-be leaders, what, what you see when you step back is that the so-called grievances of white working people, the, the, and rural people, you know, the economic insecurity, the social isolation, the despair, as measured by things like um, suicide rates or addiction rates. Yeah. Um, these are the same things that folks, black and brown people in urban communities have been feeling for generations. Yeah. And what our leaders don't do, and what frustrates me so much, 
is call attention to that shared pain. Yeah. That shared hurt and disappointment, disappointment to acknowledge that um, and not act as if, you know, the one is responsible for the other's pain um, and kind of build political opportunity and advantage on that. But instead, use the, the, that reality, that, uh, the acknowledging of that reality and the solutions to it um, as a way to unify us and to lift us. Um, and that's what frustrates me. I do think that uh, I will say I think President Biden is trying to do that. Yeah. But I th I think it is really hard for um, that message to be heard at a time when what gets attention is yeah. uh, is division and sensationalism. Which so is why I'm, I asked the other part of the question right. around the sensationalism versus being the celebrity. I mean, is that critical? How do you break through that? I don't know. I honestly don't know. I I think there are some. Uh, structural barriers, including the way our uh, social media is basically how it's run. Yeah. And uh, it's, I don't think that we should ban social media. And I don't think we should, we should limit what, what anybody can say. Well, I, you know, I think, I think there are First Amendment limitations on, uh, on trying to regulate that. But if you have a right to free speech, you do not have a right to free reach, meaning the algorithm that uh, chooses to um, inflame and uh, uh, and elevate uh, division and hate. That there's no right to that. That's a business decision that companies have uh, have made, and that I think we should regulate. But that's just part of it, right? We have to have uh, we have to have some of those folks who have a voice, who who are celebrities, um, choose grace, choose kindness, um, call that out, and elevate that. Uh, as well, and some do, some do. Yeah. And you know, it also takes me back. Um, you asked, you you said earlier to to remind me to ask you about the hopeful part of it. I was struck by what you said that some of the early narratives of people enslaved were more hopeful than many urban, you know, stories today. What are you hopeful about? Well, I think you know, like like. Just about all of us in, in the United States, we were um, stuck inside and away from others when the George Floyd uh, video was released. Yeah. And uh, thousands and thousands of people, actually all around the world, of all sorts of backgrounds, showed up in the streets. Yeah. Overwhelmingly peaceful. Overwhelmingly peaceful day after day and week after week and month after month. When I think about our famously att uh, short attention span in this country, the fact that so many people were out, many of them young, but not, not just uh, young people, yeah, um, who were acknowledging a bridge too far and who were taking the opportunity, um, in addition to um, police excesses, to call, uh, to call out economic and business excesses, um, the ways in which uh, our, uh, our public sector isn't serving um, the needs of the general uh, uh, public. There were ways in which it felt like a, a, a generation had put its collective foot down yeah. and said, we're, we're, just, we're just not going to do this anymore. Now, you know, I am, a, um, I don't think we have to throw the whole baby out with bathwater. Um, but I love the idea that there is more energy around re-examining uh, the way we do business, the way that uh, I say that as a capitalist, but yeah. the way that we do business, this notion of moving toward a more uh, a view of long term value instead of just short term uh, gain, the way we do politics, the, the, uh, there's so many great ideas about how to uh, fix the way uh, our democracy functions. They yeah, haven't yeah. moved in the Congress yet, but um, but they're great ideas uh, there. And there's great movement to elect uh, members of the House and the Senate who will move those ideas. And I think that uh, the wind is at our back. The momentum is with us in that uh, in that respect. And then I think as uh, as we do get government to be more responsive to people, not, not I've never met anybody who wants government to solve every problem in everybody's life. Yeah. But just to do its part to help us help ourselves, I see that element over time 
uh, and 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 faster coming back into public discourse, uh, driven so much by uh, by um, young people who decided that they don't have to put their idealism aside. Absolutely. And I, I love that. I really yeah. love that. Yeah, and it's wonderful to be around that energy, which you are, you know, um, in the work that you're currently doing. Yes. Going back a little to your own childhood, I, I know that you referenced the fact that in the south side of Chicago growing up, um, you remember the days when the steel mills, you know, left town, when there was uncertainty and adversity and fear. And you've also alluded to the fact that, you know, there, there is a shared collective pain and and the importance of bridging those divides and having this understanding that there are parts of America that have been left behind. Can you take us back to one of those, a moment in your childhood, Governor, that really stood out for you? I know you mentioned that when, when there was that uncertainty, the opioid crisis appeared. I think it even showed up in your own home. That's right. Is there a particular moment that stands out for you as being a really defining, difficult moment? How did you feel? What was the context? And how did you navigate through that? You know, I guess when my, my parents split when I was about four years old. And, um, and my father, who was a jazz musician, moved to New York. And my mother couldn't take care of my sister and me. My mother dropped out of high school to marry my, my father. She couldn't take care of my sister and me on, on her own yeah. uh, in, in the apartment. We moved in then to the tenement um, that my grandparents lived in, and there were various other relatives there as, uh, as well. And I really think of that as home, that home on Wabash Avenue. We were on public assistance uh, for a while. You know, my mother was depressed and despairing um, and felt left behind. Um, she did ultimately get her GED and she got a job at the post office with benefits, which was her beginning to lift herself out of uh, out of that despair and out of poverty and 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 uh, and get her independence. Now, mind you, I didn't know all that when I was four and five years old. Sure. Right. Um, uh, we were we were a part of a of a real community where every child was under the jurisdiction of every every adult on the block. Yeah. And so if you were if you were hungry and you were out playing and somebody else's kitchen door was open and their mom would easily say, well, come on and take a little bit of this. And they were poor, too. Yeah. And the expectation was that we would do the same um, for yeah. uh, for their kid. It was just that kind of, I, you know, this is I don't mean to suggest that nostalgia should drive policy or or, or what have you. I'm simply saying that we are all hungry for that sense of community, that we belong to each other. That has nothing to do with socioeconomic status that has everything to do with the human need to feel like they belong. Absolutely. And, um, and I think that there is a way in which that was expressed in my childhood, both by the adults in that community and, and this will sound strange, government policy, right? We could get food stamps when we were hungry. There was affordable housing. Uh, you know, when I was ready to go to work, there was a bus or a subway that would reliably get me to the job and back again. Yeah. And there was an economy that was growing out to make a way for other people um, uh, and new uh, and new entrance into the economy and not just up uh, to the well-connected. I think when I got um, that scholarship in uh, when I was 14 years old to go to boarding school, uh, outside of Boston, you know, I had that feeling that, um, and I knew there were just, you know, there were as many other ambitious, talented kids who would have made the most of that opportunity, um, who didn't get that opportunity. Yeah. And so being mindful of that, you know, it was, wasn't, um, it's not guilt I'm talking about. It's just what you, what is your generational responsibility? What are you supposed to do? Sure. To make it possible um, in whatever you do, just, you know, if you're a, a laborer, what do you do to make it a little easier um, for the folks who come uh, behind you? And I think these are lessons I, I tried to take away from that um, experience growing up and have tried to uh, let guide my choices uh, professionally and, and personally. Yeah, it, it also sounds like, you know, 
this scholarship. I think you went to Milton. Outside of Boston, yes. I think it was a nonprofit that helped you yes. give a better chance. Right. Um, so to what extent did that help you navigate? No one in my family had gone to university. Yeah. But I wanted to go, and no one in my family discouraged me. Yeah. They, they never said, that's not for you. Yeah. Um, you know, I had... Um, no one in my family had seen Milton Academy before I got there on my own the night before classes began. Yeah. And I remember my mother was asked by someone at the airport as she was seeing me off um, how she felt about her son going off to this school. Um, and she said, he knows, his, he knows his way home. Um, if it doesn't work out, he can come home. She was so matter of fact about it. Now, yeah. I was a, you know, a yeah. bundle of nerves. Um, and I began to make uh, uh, friends at Milton, and there were adults there who were kind to me and who understood in in words I couldn't have expressed at the time just what a cultural um, shock it was. Yeah. Um, I will say that I began to realize that, you know, my new friends at Milton were interested but so much in my life back on the south side of Chicago. And my old friends on the south side were interested, but, you know, so much in my life on the, uh, at Milton Academy. And it's to the point where it, it felt like the price of admission to the one world was rejecting the other. Interesting. And that, um, you know, you were straddling these two, um, two worlds trying to figure out yeah. how to stay um, in balance and how to, how to belong anywhere. Yeah. I think I learned early that I was going to have to figure out who I was and be that all the time no matter what environment I was, I was in. And I would lose some friends or potential friends in this place or another, but that had to do with their limitations on how they felt you had to be, yeah. what box you had to fit in yeah. um, uh, based on what, um, you know, what they saw or what limitations they were going to uh, impose that I didn't, uh, I didn't have to uh, impose those limitations on myself. And yeah. I feel like actually learning that kind of lesson as early as 14 or 15, um, painful though it was, was pretty, pretty helpful. Big lesson. Mm. It's a big lesson. So fast forward into your political career. I know you've, um, you're a very humble human being. You've also um, personally alluded to you know, the missteps that we all make. And Mandela even said he's not a saint, he's a sinner, he keeps on trying. This issue of being and having worked in multiple sectors, business, public, nonprofit, sometimes there are different hats with conflicting kind of needs and agendas and desires. Um, and sometimes even personally, personal loyalties conflict with public loyalties. Is there an example that has been difficult for you, Governor, that has created a conflict for you? What was that context? And how did you find your way through that? How mm -hmm. did you help define what is your guiding your star? What prevails? And how do I get through this conflict of interest? Yeah. Well, one I can think of, when I was appointed to head the Civil Rights Division in the first term of the Clinton administration, I was his third choice. Mm -hmm. Our mutual friend, meaning the president's and my mutual friend uh, and former colleague, Lonnie Guineer, was the first uh, named, and she was brilliant. Um, and uh, I had actually met uh, Clinton through uh, Lonnie when he was governor of Arkansas, and we sued him in a voting rights case. Yeah. And she was exactly the right person, uh, the logical person for him to nominate. Um, but after uh, several months in controversy, um, her nomination was withdrawn. And it was really painful uh, to her friends and to the civil rights community because it had been you know, 12 years that the, uh, the division had not been in the civil rights business, frankly. Yeah. Um, and then he tried uh, to float another name and that, that one flamed out as well. And then he got around mm -hmm. to me. So it felt you know, I, I, I talked to Lonnie to make sure it was OK, because it felt a little like I was, you know, stepping over uh, a friend. Um, but she was very encouraging and they wanted to send up a trial balloon. Um, and I said, no, don't do that. Do all your background. Figure out it's me or not me. Um, yeah. But when you've decided um, 
finally, then let's go. If it's me, then let's go and not before. And to their great credit, they waited. Now, so this took a whole year, this business of trying two other people and then vetting me. And in that whole year, yeah, um, actually right before my nomination was announced, the crime bill passed. And it had some good things like the Violence Against Women Act uh, in it and uh, community policing, which is a winning strategy, terrific strategy. Yeah. But it also had three strikes and you're out. It had uh, it reinstated the federal death penalty. Mm. And I had spent a good deal of my career litigating death penalty, defending uh, against the death penalty. I do not believe in the death penalty. I think mm -hmm. there's some things governments do well and some they don't. And uh, yeah. deciding life or death um, is one they don't. Um, and so I had to decide. And, and by the way, one of the people I most admired at uh, law school had gone into the Justice Department as the number two person and uh, objected to the bill. And he said, uh, and he resigned when the bill passed and was, uh, was signed because he said, uh, this sentencing uh, will lead to mass incarceration. Yeah. And of course, it spawned a whole movement of uh, state equivalents across the country and exactly that outcome. Um, so this bill has just been signed. I'm just nominated. He resigns. And I had to ask myself, am I going to go in? Now, mind you, I wasn't in the criminal division. Yeah. Um, we did have a criminal uh, civil rights section, but you know, I wasn't doing criminal work all day. Um, but did I want to be associated with that? Um, and that was really, really hard. Now, I decided to go in in part because the, the president had had so much trouble filling the position, and he'd had more than one stumble in the space of civil rights. You remember, yeah. don't ask, don't tell. Yeah. Uh, and I went in, I think we got a lot of good, uh, good work done, but that was hard. That was hard. And I was very plain, including in my, um, in my confirmation hearings that I did not agree uh, with, uh, with the death penalty, but I understood my job and I understood the oath and, um, and I would do, I could do the job. What helped you make that decision? Well, part of it had to do with, as I say, I, I wanted the division to be back in the civil rights division, uh, in, in the civil rights business, that is. I, I wanted an active uh, civil rights agenda. The president wanted that, too, and had, had a history of, uh, of that and had made that campaign promise. Yeah. Um, so pretty exciting to be in that job with an administration that was interested in, uh, in that work. Um, and I had a fantastic boss in the attorney general. Janet Reno, who was very comfortable with a direct relationship and communication between um, a sub her sub cabinet officer and the, and the president, you know, as long yeah. as I kept her in the loop. Um, and I just tried to weigh all those, uh, all those choices. Now, I did leave after the first term. Um, that was enough. Okay. <laughs> it's a pretty demanding, yeah. pretty demanding, uh, uh, pretty demanding job. But yeah, there, you know, there were, yeah. there was, uh, as they say, hair on on that decision. Yeah, absolutely. Talking about another civil rights um, icon that we both love and respect and admire, Nelson Mandela. Mm -hmm. I know that you um, actually did your first trip to the African continent in 1978 after you finished your BA degree at Harvard. That's a different story. We'll, mm -hmm. we'll pick that up. But um, I also know you were involved in drafting some of the Employment Equity Bill and also the new constitution of south africa yes has been globally acclaimed and 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 held up as uh, a shining light in many ways can you share with us what took you to south africa how did you get engaged in in writing this legislation this bill in this uh, constitution and why was that so important to you well you know the the um when the new government uh, came into power in in South Africa. The whole world was watching. Yeah, and the again the grace with which I mean, as one person described it, if if anyone was entitled to their rage, it was Black South Africans. Yeah, but Mandela, and I mean, think about how the decades of imprisonment. Yeah, um, 
but still the moral clarity and the grace. Um, and it, he made it possible for, uh, uh, for people to imagine that you could hew from, you know, a mountain of despair, a stone of hope, as Dr. King would say. Yeah. Um, so th there was so much enthusiasm um, around the world, as you know, and um, there was in particular a bilateral agreement between uh, South Africa and the United States to help in a ver variety of specific ways. And one of the ways um, was in helping uh, draft the constitution and, um, uh, and uh, specific legislation. So I was the delegate of, uh, of the Justice Department sent to help with those things. And of course, you know, you go into these conference rooms and they're experts from all over the world. Sure. Because as I said, everybody wanted to help. And, uh, and, the, and, the, and the government uh, took advantage of that. Uh, the incoming government took advantage of all of that goodwill and drew experts from around the, uh, around the world. So it was, it was humbling to be in those rooms um, as people were working through um, how, to, uh, how to build a democratic, um, uh, a democratic uh, not just a government, but a, a democratic mindset and a democratic habit of mind. And, and, and also, I think, so clear about keeping uh, in the forefront the, the cultural dimension and sensitivity, the differences in experience. In other words, not just taking um, phrases or clauses from the United States or some other uh, place and plugging them in because they sounded right, but how to think through what they actually meant in a place where, unlike the United States, Black people were in the majority. Absolutely. Um, where there was that level of opportunity gap over that long a period of, uh, uh, of time. So, um, and I, I will say that the other thing that you, you got at the time, now, you know, history is complicated, people are complicated, and South Africa is, is complicated. Um, but the other thing you got at the time was um, when I was there on those couple of first couple of visits, which were official in nature, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was underway. Yes. And um, with the Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Yes. Yeah. Yes, whom, whom I whom I met. I didn't get to meet Mandiba, but I did get to meet yes. uh, Arch. uh, the Archbishop. And um, the importance of recording those stories in real time, unvarnished, the criticality of that history being conspicuous and being that the legend wouldn't overtake the reality, um, but that the the hopefulness that can come from, you know, this term restorative justice, that you see and acknowledge the sinner yeah. um, and, uh, and where and as you can, because mm -hmm. they acknowledge the sin, you forgive it. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a notion right out of my own faith tradition. It mm -hmm. was, it was so moving. Yes. It, it was so moving and you could, you could feel it in the work that was much more mundane when I was there, but it was just in the it was just in the air. Um, what did you feel? I mean, it just it felt um, like a an, an extraordinarily hopeful time. It was a it felt as if the um, one is inclined to believe that people can be good if they're invited to be good, if they're encouraged to be good. This sounds quite naive uh, or simplistic, I guess is the thing. I think that. For anyone who doubted or anyone who was wanting to believe that the goodness in people could be summoned and put to work, building a, a new nation or building a better life, to have been in South Africa at that time with yeah. that leadership yeah. and to see that leadership emulated by ordinary people in community was a powerful powerful lesson and what the best uh, leadership can do it's remarkable and it takes me right back governor mm -hmm. and you know i i mean a follow-on question from that do you think mandela's leadership is relevant in the world today and if so why? of course i think that leadership is always relevant you know that there's a um for <laughs> I will, I will say that for idealists, and maybe most especially in the generation coming up now, they often confuse cynicism with sophistication. But cynicism is just, a, it's just 
protection. It's just a, it's a way of taking setbacks and routinizing them or normalizing them. I don't think that's leadership. Yeah. I think there is still room, um, as corny as it sounds, as um, naive as it sounds, and all the names you'll be called, um, I think that people are hungry for a horizon that is um, brighter, for their um, reach to exceed their grasp, to be encouraged um, to look up rather than down. And I'm, I'm not just talking again about leaders of masses of people. I'm yeah. talking about the example we set, the tone we set in our, in our interactions with other, with other people. I am, I am very clear-eyed. I'm not naive. I've had lots of encounters with outright evil. I've seen that. Yeah. Um, but they don't overtake or overcome or even outnumber uh, the acts of grace and kindness that I have uh, that I have experienced. And I think if you put that out there, it comes right back in multiples. Yeah. And, and to your point, how, you know, ordinary citizens took on that type of leadership. Right. You know, it imbued the nation, right. it inspired the nation, and it, is, it also inspired many people around the globe. I was curious to know in that time, and I know you met the great archers, we love to call him, um, but not Madiba. Is there a particular moment during your time in South Africa, um, apart from the TRC, or was it a moment with the TRC that really became a Mandela moment for you? A moment that his quality of leadership inspired, shaped, or influenced the way you think, act, and lead? today well I, you know what i will go back before my time in south africa if i may yeah um, you alluded to it earlier after i finished my undergraduate work i had an opportunity uh through a rockefeller fellowship to spend a year on the continent most of that time in sudan yes and um i was uh intending to work on a un project uh <laughs> When and ultimately I did, but when I got to Khartoum after hitchhiking from Cairo, and I'd never traveled outside the United States before, I learned when I uh, uh, when I found the office of the fellow I had been writing to for many months that he had left the week before for two years in Long Beach, California, and said nothing to my office about my coming. Um, and eventually, I talked my way onto the project, and and to get rid of me, they sent me to Darfur, which was another six hundred miles across the Nubian Desert, yes. out by the Libyan uh, border, an area that was uh, that is uh, in crisis today, but was um, quite calm and just remote then. And the only way to get there was on the top of a market lorry with enough food and water for uh, a five day trek. In the second day out, there was a freak rainstorm. And the yeah. uh, truck went into a skid and flipped over. Gosh. And all the cargo and the dozen or so of us riding on top of it were spread out all over the, um, all over the desert, uh, all over the sand, a couple of people with broken bones. And of course, no one's, there are no sirens. There's no one to call. There's, uh, yeah. We looked out for each other and comforted each other for the day or so it took before another lorry was coming that way and then took us, the people who were hurt, and me as the visitor to the next village where we waited a little while longer and a couple of days longer. And then a, a lorry going back toward, toward Khartoum took us. Again, the people were, who were hurt, I was okay. The people who were hurt and me yeah, because I was the visitor. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I was, I didn't have a title. I didn't have, I just had the most rudimentary Arabic. Um, the people who looked after us had nothing, but yeah. they were, um, they were generous uh, with what they had, and they were generous in their care, um, and in their um, and in their curiosity, and in their um, and in their kindness. Yeah. And I, I think um, I think that, that's what I what I what I mean by the um, by by the leadership of regular people um, that they had a lasting impact on the kind of person I wanted to be. 
and the kind of person I am trying to be. And I have had more experiences of that kind because I've been alert to it, I think, in part. Yeah. That then I can count. And I and I've and they have, you know, and they and they come back. And I'll give you, I'll give you one example. When I was in office, we were trying to do some sentencing reform. Yeah. Um, this is some time before it really caught on as a uh, uh, as a as a movement in uh, in states, but we get, we got some done, and we had a we had some points we were pushing in our bill. But as we were out and around talking with people um, uh, and trying to stay proximate, you know, to the yeah. people um, uh, we served, the thing that I kept hearing about was a uh, a relative, relatively modest reform that had to do with the ability of the formerly incarcerated being able to get work once they were out, yeah, and the ways in which their uh, their uh, criminal records followed them around to the point where they couldn't even get interviews, yeah. And so there was a modest reform called ban the box, which was being floated around, and um, and we included that in our uh, in our uh, legislation, and it passed ultimately. And I think we were one of the first states to do so. We went out to sign the bill in Roxbury, uh, a neighborhood in uh, in Boston, black neighborhood in Boston, at a place called Freedom House, which had a big hall. I think it's been torn down since. Great big hall uh, with three times the number of people in it who should have been. The fire department were about to close <laughs> it down. Yeah, uh, and it was uh, it was jammed. There was no air conditioning, and it was probably the hottest uh -huh. day in the history of time. Uh -huh. <laughs> And so the state police were a little nervous about my going into this raucous crowd. They were so excited. Yeah. Um, they, they were sort of carving away for me to get to the little table to sign the bill and make a few remarks. And then we're trying to work our way out. But there's just such jubilation. It was so beautiful. And this guy handed me a phone, his cell phone. And he said, Governor, talk to my friend. And I took the phone as I'm trying to get through the crowd. And the fellow on the other end of the phone said, Governor, thanks for signing this bill. I know it's going to make a difference for me. And I said, well, I hope you make the most of it. And I handed the phone back to this yeah. phone. I think it was four years later, we were in the Western part of the state um, going to an event and we got there a little early and we stopped in at a, a newish restaurant downtown to get takeout for lunch. Yeah. And uh, we ordered and we were standing at the, uh, at the, um, you know, the hostess station in front waiting for the food. And this guy in chef's togs walks up and he does a double take. And he said, are you Governor Patrick? And I said, yes. And he said, um, do you remember signing that that bill um, four years ago? And I said, sure. He said, do you remember talking to a guy on a cell phone that day? Yeah. He said, well, as a matter of fact, yeah. He said, well, I was that guy. I said, excuse wow. me. He said, I took that, jail, that, that phone call in jail. I said, wow. really? He said, I got out and got a job because of that bill. He said, I'm the executive chef of this restaurant today. I just want to thank you. Uh, and of course, you know, I have two big state police with me. They yeah. start crying. I start crying. That's incredible. Um, we, there were more of those kinds of encounters that it's people ask me what I feel most proud of. And they ask me about um, our accomplishments as, as, uh, as governor. They, they expect me to rattle off some piece of legislation or something like that. And we have lots to be proud of. We didn't get everything right, but we have lots to be proud of. But it's hard to describe the impact and the, and the fuel and the affirmation of the, the, the way people express being seen Absolutely. and being heard. Yeah. Um, and that's a form of kindness that yeah. I think is... Um, really, really important uh, for leadership. And I experienced what that was like, not being special other than just being the outsider. Yeah. Then I was in that, you know, little camp uh, somewhere in the Nubian desert um, waiting for some way to get back to Khartoum and start all over again. Yeah. And I'm curious in terms of that experience in the Nubian desert and also that phone call as governor, that life-changing phone call, certainly for the individual on the other side of the phone. In what sense has that been a kind of Mandela moment for you? Well, I think that there's a, um, there's a way in which, again, I didn't know him, but just from the outside looking in and reading about him and, and, uh, and watching him, 
there is a way in which this notion of servant leadership never left him, that it was not about him, that he could be in prison for as long as he was and still be thinking about the people whose own freedom needed to be won. Do you, do you know what I'm trying what to say? You, there's, a, there's a, there was a, yeah. there's an outward uh, a way of keeping the, 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 um, the needs and the aspirations of the people he led primary yeah. and not his own personal needs, personal needs, not, not his own, um, uh, prestige and importance central. Yeah. And there's a, I, I, there's a, there's a humility in that to be sure, but there's a power in that, um, for, a uh, for a leader. And, uh, that's what I saw. And that's what I, I love and admire. And that's what you experience in those two environments as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. And there are many examples of that with Madiba. And yeah, your point about that being the example of servant leadership and the power in touching lives, but also the greater power of how it brings people together because right. of the multiplier effect of that. Right, right. Yeah, that's remarkable. Shifting to a couple of fun facts. I recall reading the fact that your wonderful mother, Emily May, while you were on that sojourn in Africa, sent you a letter and said, <laughs> I'm arriving in Nigeria for Christmas. I've saved up some money and I'm arriving for Christmas. No flight details. And you landed up at an airport in Nigeria. When in Nairobi, Nairobi, Nairobi. Oh, sorry, it was in Nairobi. Kenya. Yes. It was in Kenya. And you waited for 36 hours, waiting for the <laughs> right aeroplane to land. I, some fun facts. What is the most memorable part? I think it was for Christmas, right? That's right. That's right. What was the most memorable, memorable part of that Christmas with your mother in Nairobi and Kenya? Well, first of all, that she showed up at all. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and that, you know, that we found each other because, you know, I had been away from, uh, from, uh, uh, access to mail for months. Yeah, and uh, and I I happened to get back to Khartoum um, really a few days before Christmas, and and there was her letter, and so there was no way to 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 uh, you know cell phones weren't invent weren't invented. It was really difficult to make a phone call, and too expensive yeah. for that matter. Yeah. Um, and I couldn't have written back uh, in time, so she had had no response from me. Yes. Um, she just got on the plane uh, <laughs> blind. And as you said, I didn't know what plane, what airline. Um, yeah. She'd said what day she was traveling. But of course, her arrival was the day after that um, because of the length of time. I think she flew through Stockholm or something like that and changed yeah. planes uh, there somewhere in Scandinavia. Um, and uh, so just seeing her, you know, come off the finally come out of the. Uh, out of the arrivals area and baggage claim, because I, I had thought oh, I had had happy thoughts and evil thoughts <laughs> about this. after waiting all this while in the uh, uh, in the airport. I hadn't had anything to eat, and um, and finally she came out, and you know I I burst into tears, and she just said, "Oh, I wasn't sure I was going to see you." <laughs> and, uh, we had it. We had a remarkable. Yes, we had a remarkable time. We we went up Mount Kenya together. She was a lifelong yeah. smoker, um, so she didn't make it quite uh, uh, the whole way. But that was an extraordinary experience. We spent New Year's Eve um, down at the coast at uh, at in Mombasa, yeah, uh, which was fun. We had just so many laughs, and um, and it, it was an extraordinary adventure for uh, uh for both of us and a um, and an expression of so many things her sense of adventure her love yeah um for uh, uh for me um yeah it was a long time ago but quite a quite a journey a very bold audacious mm. pioneering mother you have um the second fun fact i know at some point you applied to business you applied to different sectors but you also applied to a seminary i did and I was curious to know what drew you to the seminary? What made you decide not to go there? 
Well, it was, so this was again, finishing, uh, coming on the end of uh, my undergraduate uh, years. And I, I, yeah. I was, I was most interested in law school, but really not ready. And I thought about um, business because I'd met a bunch of business people and they seemed to have interesting uh, lives and real uh, 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 leadership opportunities. Um, and I thought about uh, and applied to uh, seminary because well, I am a person of faith and I, I felt yeah. that the, um, that the kind of impact that I wanted to have um, would be most familiar in that setting, which is to say the notion of inviting people, challenging people to bring their best selves, to overcome their fears, to, uh, yeah. to turn to each other rather than on each other. Yeah. Um, were were lessons I craved in the public sector, but uh, but that I got um, in church more often than uh, more often than not. I decided not to go because I, actually, I, I, my best friend's dad is a uh, is a minister, and uh, he had been encouraging me as well. And I said, you know, I don't know how you come up with a sermon every week. <laughs> yeah. It occurs to me maybe I'd have something to say every six months or so. Yeah. Um, I think that had a lot, uh, a lot to do with it. Um, but, um, you know, there were other things I wanted, uh, in life, uh, as, uh, as well. And I thought I might be able to get them through other, yeah. through other ways. Yeah. And third fun fact, I, I know that, um, you know, you've had a very high profile public life and often there are things that people still don't know about you despite the public scrutiny, but I also know that at some point, I mean, I, one of the things that not a lot of people know about you is that you're a beekeeper. Yes. That you've uh, taken care of, I think, four beehives over 10 years, and you you like the honey, you like the fact that they pollinate, and I think it also slows you down in life. Right. Um, I was curious to know, what is another unknown fact about you, or little known fact about you? Hmm. Well, let's see. I like to horseback ride. You do. I don't know that many people know that about me. I don't get to do it very often. Yeah. Um, I love the animals. They're big and powerful. They're incredibly sensitive to um, mood and attitude, and you know, uh, they're they're extraordinary animals. I remember I actually, I had one of the most exciting rides in South Africa. Really? Where I was? did. It was north of Durban oh. at, a at a horse farm uh, where at that time, I don't think they do anymore, but at that time they used to breed liposoners. Do you know those that breed? Yeah. Yes, um, I do. Yeah. From, for the, is it the Spanish Riding Academy, something like that, where they, they, um, they perform? But they, they, they had, uh, I remember early one morning, we only stayed there overnight. I was visiting uh, with a friend's um, a friend's various research uh, uh, spots. He was doing research around AIDS uh, through yeah. NGH. And um, this is many, many years ago. And early one morning, uh, we saddled up just before um, sunrise and rode up into the, into the hills on these extraordinary uh, horses. And I, I, I think about it to this day. It was just, it was just magic. I've never found, it's not pretty. My form is not pretty, but I haven't, <laughs> I can stay on. Where did you learn to ride horses? Well, when I was at, at uh, I've always been interested, you know, in the, in the public park, not far from our house, uh, they had, um, they had trails and on the other side of the park uh, in Hyde Park, where the University of Chicago is, yeah. it's a fa fairly fancy neighborhood. And, and there were stables at that time along the uh, park where folks who lived in Hyde Park would keep their horses. This is a long time ago. So you'd see folks out early in the morning when it was still cool, uh, riding on the uh, on the trails. And I always thought those were amazing. And you could have a trail ride, you know, they'd walk you. Yeah. Um, but when I was at Milton, uh, there were uh, uh, there were stables not too, you know, maybe a couple miles walk from school. I had a I had a paper route, and I would use my money uh, on uh, on Sundays to go and take uh, trail trail rides. And I did that every, every week for years. Wow. Uh, and I got more confident then and more, more comfortable. And at, yeah. at a point, you know, before uh, insurance concerns kicked in, they, um, one of the stable owners would let me take a pony out and 
uh, yes. out into the woods and ride on my own. It was fun. Oh, fantastic. Well, by the way, Durban is where I grew up. And is that right? Yeah. And in fact, there was another place close to Durban called Chongweni where they had the big polar riders, mm. the big polar matches and international polar matches. So mm. that area was well known for horse riding. And um, so what a gift that you did this in Milton and did this outside Durban. Um, that's wonderful. Shifting back to the future of leadership. What are your thoughts around the future of leadership? What would you say to our young future leaders that are up and coming? Well, you know, versions of what we've talked about. Try to um, avoid the temptation of celebrity alone. Have a have a reason. Yeah. Uh, have a why. Yes. Um, and serve that why and the people who are uh, who are served by that why. Um, and uh, and and think not just about your generation, but generations to come. I think the other thing that is really, really hard um, for notwithstanding or maybe because of the marvelous impatience and militance in some ways of the uh, uh, of uh, of the younger generation, you know, no one person, no one party has a corner on all the best ideas. Of course. And so the notion of listening hard and um, uh, to to someone who may, disagree, trying to lead not just those who already agree, but those who don't, I think is critical because in, at one level or another, so many people today are feeling unseen and unheard. Yeah. And um, they don't need to agree with everything um, that lead in on the business side or the, or the, um, or the political side. They don't need to, and they don't want to agree with everything. They don't want their views to be you have to agree on everything before you can work together on anything yeah they just want to be acknowledged in their own life experience that has led them to their views acknowledged yeah um, and that has to happen i think on the way to persuading people uh to come and uh, and work alongside you yeah would you ever run for president again oh gracious <laughs> <laughs> You know, people say never say never, um, and I yeah. keep my options open. But I, I feel like, in a way, my my politics are, um, you know, as I said, it's just it's so much harder um, to get a, a a politics of unity heard in an in an environment that's all about um, sensationalism and and division. So um, my guess is it will be up to others, but I will uh, mm -hmm. I'll do what I can to encourage them. Yeah. And in our final few moments, Governor, given that we have, um, you know, the 2024 elections coming up, is there anything else that you would say to the candidates that are already have put their hat into the ring or will still put their hat into the ring on either side of the aisle? Um, that's any different to what you've already said, but is there anything else you would say to candidates on both sides of the aisle in the run up to the 2024 elections? There's nothing I would say that they would listen to, I'm sure. Well, you never know. You never know. But I, I look, but it's a it's it's a it's a version of what I've said al already, Anne. Yeah. Their candidacy and their service is not about them. Yeah. It's about us. Yeah. All of us. And um I'm not interested in a president who's interested only in being uh president of his party. Um, or of uh, of those uh, who agree with him. I'm interested in a president who's interested in being president of the United States. Yeah. And uh, and speaking to and working for all of us um, everywhere. Yes, yes. Well, on that note, Governor, thank you so much. Thank, thank you for you. your excellent work. It's always a joy to connect with you. I'm so looking forward to doing more with you in this initiative and in this movement, and just thank you for your amazing, excellent work, your wisdom, and for the kind, compassionate person that you are. Well, I hope to become the man you described. Thank you so much, Anne. It's great thank to be with you. As we reflect upon the compelling leadership insights from former presidential candidate and the first Black governor of the state of Massachusetts, Deval Patrick, I'm left pondering his big question. Why? Is it harder to hear and sell a message of unity in the United States and in many parts of the world today in this age of sensationalism and celebrities? 
What happened in the United States of America once the global gold standard for democracy? Why would the USA today not respond well to a message of unity? What fuels the war more than what motivates unity and peace? And when could or would a message of unity pierce the stubborn veil of anger, of division, and man-made hate? It took me back to the violence on the streets in apartheid South Africa, years of brutal oppression, murders, and assassinations. During that time, my MBA professor, Professor Fonzel Slabbert, or Van as we like to call him, was a well-known political analyst, a businessman, and a politician, best known for being the leader of the official opposition to the apartheid nationalist government and leading a party called the Progressive Federal Party. He taught us a class during our MBA called the Environment of Business, where we learned about the political wars, the culture, and the social wars that were impacting the country. He spoke about the hockey stick syndrome. When a nation or an organization is at war on a slippery slope downward, it is like a hockey stick. The real questions are, how long is the stick? When do we get to the bottom before the stick starts to turn and bend upwards? And what is the tipping point that leads to that stick bending upwards as it curves? The length of the stick defines how long we live in trauma and pain. Firstly, it's fueled by ego, by fear, by the desire to win at all costs. It's a zero-sum game. Secondly, people will fight and continue to fight as long as they think there is some possibility of winning at all costs, with little or no thought about the long-term consequences and the costs not only to others, but to themselves. And thirdly, the greater the threat and the higher the stakes, the more people gravitate towards the easy, quick fix. We scramble to the polls to elect those people into power who create this sensationalism, this drama, rather than deliver substance, who tell us what we want to hear rather than what we need to hear. Perhaps we can gain some timeless wisdom from a great Russian novelist, and writer Leo Tolstoy, who wrote the masterpiece, War and Peace. What did Tolstoy teach us? Firstly, there's a burden to war. Secondly, the folly of pride. Pride often costs us dearly. Thirdly, the duality of human nature, on the one hand driven by ego and a struggle for identity, and on the other hand, there is a timeless quest for meaning in life, for harmony, and for happiness. And finally, he taught us that nothing is permanent, nothing is constant. So the penultimate question and opportunity to bend the hockey stick upwards is, do we lead the change? with thoughtful, bold action, or does the change forcibly lead us? Until next time, take care and take thoughtful, bold action. Thank you for listening to this episode of Leading Boldly into the Future. Please find links and connections mentioned in this show in our blog and never miss an episode by subscribing at ann-pratt.com. That's A-N-N-E-P-R-A-T-T.com. May these insights from inspiring industry leaders, remarkable disruptors, and courageous champions of change bring forth a brand new you, emboldened, empowered, and ready to inspire hope. Come back soon, share with your friends, 
Sign up on ann-pratt.com and join our movement for change. Why? Because the world needs you to lead boldly too.